everyone. This is Dr. Stewart. I'm here to talk through a case study in using propensity scores. What I'm going to do in the next little while is basically try to show you from beginning to end the steps that you need to do when carrying out a propensity score analysis. This is going to include data organization and setup, propensity score estimation, how to use those propensity scores, at least a touch on that, covariate balance diagnostics, effect estimation, and then finally, analysis of sensitivity to an unobserved confounder. So I know that might sound like a lot right now, but uh, we'll just step through each of them one at a time so you can sort of see what an analysis looks like, again, from beginning to end. This is going to be presented with a particular motivating example, but I also will be sort of highlighting bigger picture lessons as we go along, using the example as just sort of the motivation. In this relatively short lecture, I'm not going to be able to cover all the nuances of these methods and sort of all of the different possibilities. The idea here is, again, just to give you sort of the main ideas and some pointers to where you can go to get more details. So let's talk a little bit about that motivating example. Um, in some ways, this is a best case scenario in terms of data availability. Um, and you know that's both good and bad for pedagogical purposes, but I think it will provide a nice example of how to do a propensity score analysis. So this example was looking at the effects of psychosocial therapy after suicide attempt. Just as a little bit of context for this, looking at the effects of interventions on suicide risk is quite difficult. It requires very large samples, a very long follow-up, and thus it's really hard to do in a randomized design. So this is a context where strong non-experimental studies are a very nice alternative. So what we did in this example was we used this amazing Danish registry data to essentially compare outcomes of individuals who received psychosocial therapy after a suicide attempt to similar individuals who hadn't received that therapy. And we'll be talking much more, and really the whole point of this is to go through kind of how we exactly did that. As a little context of this particular intervention, these suicide prevention clinics began operation in Denmark in 1992, and they are now nationwide. While they were getting rolled out, they sort of were in different locations at different times. They, again, sort of geographic spread was somewhat random, and so different people had different access to them. And again, we'll come back to that. The wonderful thing is that the Danish registry data, which again, I'll, I'll tell you more about, but it basically allows really long-term follow-up as well as extensive information on these individuals, both before they did or didn't receive this psychosocial therapy, but then also long-term follow-up of their suicidal outcomes. So let me tell you a little bit more about this data set. Those of you who maybe come from Europe or just know about the Scandinavian registries know that they are amazing resources unlike anything we certainly have in the United States. So these registers basically are administrative sources for the entire country that merges together various information about people. So in this case, we were using a combination of what's called the Danish Civil Register, which is sort of basic information about individuals, their family status, marital status, birth and death dates, things like that. The National Registry of Patients, which has information on the medical treatments and, and conditions that people have. A psychiatric central registry that has information on their psychiatric conditions and treatment. And then also a registry of causes of death. And relevant for suicide in particular is that there's a real strong belief and knowledge that suicide is actually captured quite reliably in this data, unlike many other data sources. But in Denmark, uh, the stigma is less and there's a real feeling like this is a trustworthy source of suicide information. So to be a little bit more specific now about what we're going to be comparing, we have a treatment group who, again, are users of these suicide prevention centers after they had a suicide attempt, who then received one or more psychotherapeutic treatment sessions at one of these centers. So the idea is that people who had a suicide attempt were sometimes referred to one of these suicide prevention centers. They might have been referred by their treating physician. They might have just known about it from their community, but they did have to have sort of an index suicide attempt to then be able to go to one of these suicide prevention centers. So in that sense, what we're really looking at here is this sort of treatment group as people who had a suicide attempt and then went to one of these centers to prevent another attempt. The comparison group and sort of the comparison condition is basically people who did not receive treatment from one of these centers. So using the data, we are able to identify people who did have an attempted suicide, 
but who then didn't follow up with um, any treatment from one of these clinics. So again, what's really nice is, you know, we wouldn't really want to use a comparison group of all individuals in Denmark. We want to be able to compare the treatment group with people who had also attempted suicide. And so that's what we do here. It's sort of people who were in some sense eligible to go to one of these centers, but who didn't actually do so. We have a data on people from ages 10 and up and a follow-up period for about 20 years. So our total sample is about 6,000 treatment group members, so about 42, 43,000 person years. And our comparison group is about 10 times that size with 60,000 people and over 500,000 person years. So just for those of you who might be interested in the content a little bit more, just a little bit more on the treatment that we're looking at, these centers really were very sort of person focused in a sense. So each clinic had a variety of different therapies that an individual might receive. They included things like cognitive behavioral therapy, problem solving, uh, crisis help, dialectical behavior treatment, social worker support, sort of really kind of in some sense, whatever this person needed to help them move forward. Again, as I alluded to earlier, patients were referred from either somatic or psychiatric emergency departments, general hospital wards, maybe from their general practitioner or also self-referral. So again, we believe that there's some variability in access basically just due to geography or timing. So some randomness in sort of who was able to go to one of these centers, not just based on sort of who was motivated to go or not. Again, just a little bit of content. On average, each person who went to one of these centers uh, received about eight to 10 sessions that spanned about two months of time. So not a super intensive treatment, sort of about two months of this fairly specialized care. So again, as I've alluded, the concern here and the reason we're talking about propensity score methods here is that the people who choose to participate in this treatment or who are able to go to one of these centers might differ from those who don't. So what we're doing here is we're going to use a two-pronged strategy. Um, first, we will use propensity score methods to deal as well as possible with the observed characteristics and try to equate the treatment and comparison groups on a large set of observed characteristics. And then as a second step, we will do a sensitivity analysis to consider how an unobserved confounder might change our study conclusions. So let's dig into what variables we're able to equate these groups on. Again, this is a really nice data example because these registries have such extensive data on individuals, again, on the entire country of Denmark. So in this case, uh, we worked with subject matter experts who understood the Danish context uh, as well as suicide risk and identified 31 potential confounders that we wanted to equate the groups on. So this included some demographics, things like the calendar time, gender, age, whether they were born in Denmark or not, their civil status, which is essentially employment, their educational level, their socioeconomic status, uh, using a few different measures, whether they live in an urban or rural area, and whether they're married and, and have children or not. We also, very importantly for this scientific area, uh, also have information on their suicide attempt, the sort of index attempt that made them eligible for this treatment. We know both whether they had had previous attempts and how many of those previous attempts, as well as the method of attempt, which is a particularly important variable here because it is a strong predictor of a repeat attempt. We also know a lot about individuals' psychiatric diagnoses, in particular, whether they have mood disorders, anxiety, personality disorders, post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, eating disorders, drug abuse, alcohol abuse, schizophrenia, antidepressant treatments, et cetera. And then finally, and what is in some ways really amazing about this data source is that we also know family history. So we're able to link individuals with their parents and know whether their parents had a psychiatric disorder as well as their parents' suicidal behavior. So again, this is really a best case. In many examples, you're not going to have as extensive a set of variables uh, where you might be even more worried about unobserved confounders. But here, uh, there's a real belief that we're observing the bulk of the confounders that might differ between the treatment and comparison groups and that would be related to repeat suicide attempts. So let's talk about this sort of concept more generally, sort of how do we think about variable selection? And 
So essentially the idea, and this is sort of the easy answer, is to say that you should equate the groups or match the groups on things related to treatment receipt and on outcomes. The fundamental assumption underlying this is unconfounded treatment assignment, basically that there's no unobserved differences between the treatment and comparison groups once we equate them on these observed covariates. So that assumption is very questionable if you can only include a small set of covariates, for example, just basic demographics. And that is usually not going to give sufficient bias reduction for estimating a causal effect. Better scenarios are ones like we have here, where we have an extensive set of covariates and we're able to think carefully about the conceptual model and to help understand the factors that likely influence treatment selection and outcomes, and also sort of develop a deep understanding of that treatment selection process. That's a little easier said than done in some ways, so let's dig into this a little bit more. There is a bit of a trade-off in the sense that we can include quite a few variables in our sample equating approach, our propensity score approach, and including more variables rather than fewer is going to make that key unconfoundedness assumption more likely to be satisfied. The trade-off is that if you include too many variables, you can have higher variance in your effect estimates and potentially worse balance on truly important variables. The sort of variable that leads to a lot of debate is something that would be called an instrument, which is one that is related to treatment choice or treatment assignment, but is actually unrelated to outcome. And there's some results that show that this can cause variance increases in a substantial way. I usually though in practice don't really worry too much about that in part because we usually don't have true instruments that are completely unrelated to outcome. Usually we have variables that are somewhat related to treatment and somewhat related to outcome. And in general, I would say it's better to include things than to exclude them. So that's expanded on a little bit on this slide. Again, my take is that in large samples, you should be generous in what you include and err on the side of including more rather than fewer. If you have a very small sample size, you might have to be in some sense picky or choosy. And in that case, you should concentrate on the variables that you think are strongly related to the outcomes and really make sure to get good covariate balance on those strong outcome predictors. In that sense, the most important type of variable to include are pretreatment measures of the outcome. If you have sort of a baseline measure of the outcome, in our case, for example, their suicide attempt history, those are going to be particularly important because those are strong predictors of the outcome. Again, err on the side of including more than less. And essentially, the cost of excluding something is usually higher than the cost of including something that maybe you don't really have to. One thing I sometimes do in practice is to sort of think about variables and categories. And I'll have like three buckets in my mind. Those that I sort of think are the strongest confounders and I know that I really need to include. Those that I sort of I'm not sure about or I think are moderate confounders where like it will be nice if I can include them. And then those where I'm sort of not really that worried about them, but you know, again, it would be nice if we get covariate balance on them, but it's not gonna be sort of make or break. And I will, in the analysis, basically make sure that I have good balance on those strong confounders and then sort of worry about the others as second and third priorities. There are some types of variables though that you definitely should not include. And there's sort of two there. One is that you should not include variables that might have been affected by the treatment. So really what's best is to have temporal ordering where you can include variables that you know were measured before your treatment was applied. The issue is that things that are sort of after treatment might have been affected by the treatment and it can cause bias to simply adjust for those or equate the groups on those. The other type of variable you can't include are variables that are perfectly predictive of treatment assignment. If we have some confounder that is an incredibly strong predictor of who gets treatment or comparison conditions, we really can't include that. I'll let you think for a second about why. Basically, the issue there is if we have something perfectly predictive of treatment assignment, we have incredibly strong confounding, and we're just not able to separate out the effect of the treatment that we care about from that other factor. We have complete non-overlap in the treatment and comparison groups. So in that sense, we really can't even estimate the causal effect that we had actually been trying to estimate. Okay, so let's assume that we now have our data set. We have um, an indicator of whether someone's in the treatment or comparison group. And then in this case, we have our 31 covariates. 
What do we do with those to estimate propensity scores? Basically, to get the propensity score for each person, we need a model of treatment assignment or treatment receipt given the covariates. The propensity scores themselves will be the predicted values um, for each person obtained from these models. So in some sense, what we're doing here is we're gonna create another column in our data set called propensity score or something like that, which will be these predicted probabilities that we get out of a model of treatment assignment given these 31 covariates in this case. So in some ways you can use whatever your favorite binary regression type model is. Certainly logistic regression is very commonly used for estimating propensity scores. In the past five or 10 years though, there's really been growing awareness that in some ways, non-parametric models or sort of more like machine learning approaches often work better basically because they are much more flexible. Because they are much more flexible and will allow for interactions and nonlinear terms in much more automated ways than does logistic regression. So essentially, you don't have to worry as much about model misspecification than with a logistic regression approach. So in particular, methods like boosted CART, which is uh, classification and regression trees, or random forests work particularly well for propensity score estimation. One thing I really want to highlight is that the diagnostics that we then do are not standard model diagnostics. So if you've taken a Biostat or STAT 101 class, you might have learned all sorts of lovely logistic regression model diagnostics, things like C statistics, which kind of tell you the predictive ability of a model. Those are not relevant for propensity scores. In some ways, actually having a highly predictive model, a model where we can perfectly predict treatment and control groups is a bad situation for causal inference. We sort of need to believe that there's some randomness in who got treatment and control conditions. And if we can perfectly predict treatment and control based on the observed covariates, again, that is a sign that we just have incredibly strong confounding and it might be in fact impossible to estimate the causal effect of interest. So in some ways, what we want is a C statistic of like 0.5, sort of not very predictive. So we don't really even care about that for our diagnostic purposes. We also, you might have sort of heard about checking the collinearity of covariates or sort of looking at the coefficients themselves. Again, here, we don't care about that. You're worried about collinearity and regression models because it increases the variance of regression coefficients. But in this case, all we're trying to get out of these models are the predicted probabilities. So in some sense, it, things like collinearity of covariates doesn't matter, and we don't even really care about the coefficients themselves. So again, it's a little bit of a different scenario than we're used to. Sort of offhand, but this is in part why some of the machine learning methods work pretty well. Um, sometimes people don't like machine learning methods because they are somewhat black box, where you don't see like regression coefficients in them. In our case, all we care about are the predicted probabilities that come out of it, and so the black box nature is perfectly fine. What we do care about is basically whether the approach results in samples with good covariate balance, whether our treatment and comparison groups look similar on the observed covariates, uh, and we'll come back to that in a few slides. 